Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to episode two of my activator's guide. Today, we're gonna to talk about field antennas. Uh, now, I am by no means an expert at this. I said this at the beginning of my last episode. I'm gonna say it again today. I'm not an expert in this stuff. I've got a decent amount of experience with the stuff in the field, and that's why I figured I'd give you my, my, uh, my rundown of what I've found that works and what doesn't. Uh, but I am not an antenna expert by any means. There are people who are way, way, way more knowledgeable about this stuff than I am. But I just wanted to give you an idea of some of the different possibilities, some of the things you might want to think about, some of the things that I found that work, some of the things that I found haven't worked all that great. Now, the only antenna I have set up today, well, I've got my, my shack antenna, which is above me, but the only antenna I've got set up today is this Wolf River Coil Sporty 40. And I've got it on a Gable Antennas tripod. This, this tripod is very, very good. It's very robust. It's, it's very adjustable. It, it's well thought out. So if you're looking for a good tripod, I would really recommend this thing. But let's talk about this antenna for a minute. You'll see why I've got this set up. So we've got our, our Gable tripod. We've got our Sporty 40 coil from Wolf River Coils. And then we've got a 213 inch whip, all right? Now you'll see that I've got this link here. Um, I actually stole this idea from uh, Michael, KB9VBR. You can connect and disconnect this to bypass the coil. So if you wanna run 40 meters, there you go. You wanna run 20 or below, we hook this tap up it bypasses the coil and now we're just running a quarter wave vertical so that way I don't have to take this coil out but here's the thing about this antenna now when this is packed down it's very small all right this this whip is only like 20 something inches long I mean you can see how short this coil is but here's the problem with an antenna like this it is 17 feet tall and the radial field is massive. It's like 37 feet, 36 and change feet, all right? There, I, now this, you could, you could build a different radial field for this. This radial field that I've got set up made out of these 24 gauge silicone jacketed wire. I actually stole this radial field idea from uh, Pat Rundall, N0HR. These are 12, 16 foot uh, radials spread out all the way around me here. This was the only way I could get this antenna to tune on 20 meters. It would tune on everything else with way fewer radials. But if I wanted to tune it on 20, this is what I had to lay out. So if you look at how big this is, it's hard to see because all these little orange wires on the ground. But I mean, this goes, like I said, it's about 30, 32, 33 feet. Okay, it's huge and it's 17 feet tall. So even though this is a small antenna, it's not when it's all set up. So that's something you need to keep in mind. When we talk about setting antennas up, one of the things you've got to consider is space. We'll talk about that in a minute. But like I said, I wanted to set that antenna up because I wanted to give you an idea just how big these things can actually be. You know, you look at pictures and it doesn't really do them justice. Uh, like I said, when this thing's packed down, it fits in a backpack, but set up, it's huge. All right, it takes up a lot of real estate, both on the ground and in the air. So, I have a whole slew of stuff out here today, and we're going to talk about all this stuff. And again, I do not have every kind of antenna known to man. Some of the antennas I'm going to talk about today, I don't even own. But I want to cover them because they are things you may run into. So, just like last time, I have my cheat sheet here that we're going to work from. And I will link this below so you can have access to it. So we'll kind of run down through all the different things on this sheet, talk about some of the things you need to consider. So when we talk about antenna selection, one of the first things we need to figure out is do we want to run a wire antenna, a vertical antenna, a loop? All right, you got a lot of different options. Wire antennas, you know, like a dipole or an NFED half wave, um, they're nice, they pack down real small. So here's, here's my entire NFED half wave kit. So this will run uh, 40, 20, 15, and 10. That's the whole antenna. All right, so I've got this little spark plug antennas transformer. This thing works amazingly well and it's tiny. And then the wire itself. Again, same wire that the radio the radial field's made out of for that. It's just black. Um, the stuff that I use on the ground, I like to run orange so you can see it, because people are gonna walk through this. And we're gonna talk about traffic in a minute. This thing's gonna be way up in the air, so I'm not worried about people running into it. Uh, so, you know, you look at a wire antenna, they're tiny. Now, a vertical. Right, that's not gonna pack down as small as this is. You've got that whole, ra that whole uh, radial field, you've got the coil, you've got the tripod, you've got that huge whip. But there are advantages to verticals we'll talk about in a minute too. 
right? Um, so wire versus vertical, that's gonna be kind of a, a, a personal preference and it's also gonna, a lot of it's gonna be dependent on where you're actually gonna do your activation. Loop antennas, I don't really have an experience with loop antennas. Uh, from what I know of them, they pack down fairly small and they're fairly easy to set up, but they can be really finicky to tune and they're very high Q. So that's something you need to consider, okay? Um, sorry, that plane is extremely loud. There's an airport not very far from me and that plane just took off. So, so keep in mind, with a loop antenna, you may be fiddling around trying to get it to tune. Uh, N-fed versus dipole, so that's something you might want to consider too, right? So an N-fed is exactly what it sounds like. It's fed from one end of the wire, right? A dipole, so I've got two dipoles here. They're both homemade dipoles. I don't, most of my antennas are homebrew. I have a few commercial ones. My verticals are commercial, but. So here's just a simple speaker wire dipole built out of a BNC binding post and some speaker wire. That's a 20 meter dipole. Again, it's not much bigger than this and fed. In fact, this is bigger wire, but the, the antenna itself is not much bigger. In fact, it's probably smaller. It's shorter because it's only 20 meters and this is a 40 meter end fed. But you, you, there are advantages and disadvantages to each, right? So the end fed is a multi-banded antenna, right? That's something you've got to consider also. The, di the dipole is going to be a monoband antenna unless you run a link dipole. So like this one, you'll see in a later video of mine, I run this antenna. This is a little tiny link dipole I built. Again, BNC binding post, it's that little tiny wire. All right, but this one is linked for 20, 30, and 40 meters. You just disconnect your links to change bands. Now, yes, you have to lower the antenna to change the bands, but this is a multi-band antenna, right? I can run 20, 30, 40 on this. This is a little more finicky. It's got more stuff going on. Now, I built this to come apart. So you can disconnect these spade terminals, disconnect these little plastic hooks, and this thing can come apart. So if I just want to bring the 20 meter portion I can or I can pack the other ones up and take them off and put them on if I want them right um, I kind of like to be able to take these apart so that they're not so unwieldy because these can get a little obnoxious so I apologize if the sun starts rolling in here too when I first started filming it was really uh, shady right here but it's not so much anymore so like I said when you look at when you look at antennas you know if you're looking at wire antennas or you would you want to look at an end fed do you want to look at a dipole they both have, have advantages and disadvantages okay um, like I said Multi-banded for an N-fed, dipoles are gonna be mono-band unless you build a link dipole. Ver uh, vehicle mounted antennas, that's something else you might wanna consider, right? If you're gonna operate from a vehicle, some of these antennas can be mounted on vehicles, some of them can't. I mean, you're not gonna you know, run a dipole from your truck, you could run a vertical. Uh, so, like I said, when we talk about advantages and disadvantages, wire antennas are real small, they pack down real light, they're very simple, uh, they're you, they usually hear very well, they usually transmit very well. Uh, I'm a fan of wire antennas. When we look at Q, right, some of these are real low Q, some of them are real high Q. These these wire antennas, I mean, that that 20 meter dipole right there covers the entire 20 meter band. You, you, that SWR is per, good the whole way across, all right? Uh, that vertical out there, not so much. You've got to fiddle with that thing to get it adjusted because it's much higher Q. All right, this gable, which you've seen in other videos, <clears throat> this thing is even higher Q. I mean, this, with the coils in there, can take some, some fiddling around to try to get the tune right. Now, I've got it down to a science. I can get this thing tuned up pretty fast. But the first time you play with one of these, little tiny movements on the coil equate to huge changes in SWR. So if you're gonna run a vertical, uh, keep in mind that it may take some messing around with to get it how you want it. You're gonna have to play with your radial fields. Now, uh, I have never played with the window mesh, window screen, ground planes for these things yet. I have nothing against them and I'm gonna do one. The reason I haven't yet is most of the time these are going in a backpack and going out in the woods. A huge piece of window screen rolls up massive. It doesn't weigh anything, but it's huge and it's hard to pack. So if I'm doing a, an activation next to my vehicle maybe, yeah, I might do that. Throw the, the uh, window screen on the ground, you know, alligator clip from there to the to the base of the antenna and you're good to go. But this radial field here, these 12 radials, pack down pretty small and they're very light. So for a backpack, this works better. It takes up way, way, way more space on the ground though. So, you know, if you're looking at a window screen, it only takes up maybe four by eight. This thing takes up, like I said, 36 feet. So that's something to consider too. But like I said, these are gonna be fairly high Q. A loop is gonna be the highest Q. A loop 
you you touch that knob a tiny bit and you've you've gone from like a one to one swr to five to one swr because you sneezed on it efficiency that's something else we need to consider so some of these antennas are much more efficient than others okay so radio uh, i'm sorry um resonant antennas are always going to be the most efficient right so this is resonant on like i said 40 20 15 and it'll work on 10 but the swr is a little high that dipole resonant on 20 meters that link dipole right there resonant on 20 30 and 40 meters that vertical resonant on everything from 40 to i can get that all the way down to six meters all right now it's fiddly i've got to mess with the length of the whip and the radials and all that stuff but i can tune this so it's resonant no tuner from four or from 40 meters all the way down to six meters this gable this has got a coil for that'll run everything from 40 to six i think is it 40 to six I think so. Uh, yes, 40 to 6. And then it's also got an 80 meter coil in there too. Now the 80 meter coil is super high Q. Super, super high Q. So, you know, you, you, when you land on a frequency, that's where you need to be. You can't budge unless you go retune it. But this will run 80 to 6. And this thing, you can see how small this is, right? I mean, this antenna is tiny. So that's something to consider also. Now, those are resonant. That doesn't mean that's going to be as efficient as, let's say, a dipole or my NFET half wave. It's not, it's got less radiating element in the air, right? I forget how long the whip is on this thing, but it is not super long. This entire antenna is only 2.6 meters long. That's with the whip, the coils, everything, 2.6 meters long, okay? So you don't have a ton of radiating element in the air. This is a 66 foot long wire. You got a lot of wire in the air, right? That's a 32 roughly foot wire, right? That link dipole is 66 feet of wire. That Wolf River coils out there is a 17 foot whip. So it's a quarter wave on 20 meters. And then I can change the length of that whip to change my bands. So I've got a lot more radiating element in the air with this big 17 foot whip than I do with that little tiny whip in that gable antenna. So it's gonna be more efficient to run a bigger antenna like that. The trade off is it's bigger, right? Uh, setup difficulty, that's something you've got to consider too. Some of these things are pain in the butt to set up. Right, I mean, if you're gonna set a wire antenna up, you've gotta have either, you gotta be able to get it up a tree or you're gonna need a mast, things like that. This thing, I've gotta set the, the tripod up. I've gotta put this thing all together. I've gotta to string all these radials out, right? So some of these are kind of fiddly, that link dipole. If I wanna change bands, I've gotta lower the thing, disconnect the links, so they can be a pain in the butt to set up. Do you need any other equipment? Do you need throw lines, guy lines, things like that, right? You're probably, if you're using a wire antenna, you're probably gonna need a throw weight and throw line of some sort. So this is an eight ounce weaver with 65 feet of reflective high-vis cord. This is my main throw line I use most of the time. If I'm gonna be in really thick, dense brush, that's a 12 ounce weaver. All right, if I'm trying to go super duper light, you guys have seen this on my channel before with my SW3B kit. This is just a ripstop nylon bag with a piece of paracord sewn in and the same cordage here inside this bag. And this rolls down tiny so you can stuff that in it weighs nothing you this is this has got a velcro closure on top you fill this full of rocks it does the same thing nowhere near as robust as these weaver bags these things are pretty much indestructible this eventually the rocks will poke holes in it i'm going to start building these out of like either 500 or 1000 d cordura i'm probably going to use dyneema for the uh for the loop so it's super duper tough and we'll see how that works um, i might if, if it works well and i want one that's super robust i might stitch one that's 500d on the outside and leather on the inside to really keep it from po poking holes in it but that's something you've got to consider do you need a throw line and and wait because if you're using a wire antenna you've got to have a way to get it up in the tree all right does it need radials like i said some of these antennas are going to need a ton of radials that thing's got like i said 12 16 foot radials coming off of it that pile of speaker white right there, speaker wire, those are all different radials for this gable. Now I'm gonna rebuild all of those in this little tiny 24 gauge wire. I like this stuff better. That silicone wire, and that's what I build all my antennas out of, it doesn't tangle. Like you can wrap, wrap that stuff in a rat's nest and it comes untangled, no problem. The stuff is amazing. You can get it on Amazon for like, I don't know, 20 or 25 bucks a roll. It's really good stuff. 250, 250 feet is like 20 bucks, 25 bucks, something like that. Uh, do you need chokes or balance? Uh, I forgot to bring my tor toroid out here. Uh, I was going to talk about that, but I'll just talk about it instead of show it to you. You might need an RF choke. Some of these things are going to feed RF back into the radio, so you might need a toroid. You can, a lot of times, with coax, we'll talk about in a minute, wrap loops of coax to work as a choke. 
right? You might use an actual toroid and wrap, wrap windings of the coax around the toroid to do that. You know, you might need a ballon if you're running a, a, a dipole. Now, I, I generally get away without them. I don't usually need them. Usually I just run the dipole as it sits. I usually just use those BNC binding posts. And then, like I said, I'll put a couple of loops, three, four, five, six loops of, depending how long the coax is, of coax up at the top. I'll wind it up, uh, hook it shut so that it stays looped up with either a wire tie or something, and then leave that right up near the feed point, and that kind of does the same thing. It's not quite as good as an actual choke, but I've found that, generally speaking, that gets the job done pretty well. Okay, but that's something you've got to consider. You may need chokes, balance, things like that. Let's talk about coax for a minute. Coax, first we got to consider size. How big a amount of coax are you willing to carry? So I've got multiple different lengths here. So I've got Oops, we're stuck together. These are magnetics, so they like to hook together. I have three different lengths of RG316 here. Let me hook this back together so my J pole doesn't come undone. We'll talk about this antenna later. Okay, so I've got three different lengths of RG316 here. This is normally my go to uh, coax from the field. So on this spool, this 3D printed spool, that's 33 feet of RG316. That's a 25 foot spool. That's a 15 foot spool. The length that I use most of the time is 25 feet. It's a good balance between bulk, weight, and enough length to get the job done, all right? If I'm trying to go super light or I'm not worried about getting the antenna crazy high in the air, I might run a 15 foot section. If we've got considerations where I've got to be able to run coax for a ways, I'll use this 33 foot piece, but I don't normally run a piece this long. Because again, Remember, the longer your coax, the more loss you're gonna have, right? So we've also got, so I've got just a piece of RG8X here. I think this is 15 feet, All right? This is much heavier. It's not as flexible. Uh, this works better. This is, this is probably lower loss. This works better if you're running more power or if you're running higher frequencies, you gotta be careful too, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but I don't usually carry coax this big in the field just cause that's big and bulky and heavy. Like the stuff I've got in my house is ABR. It's equivalent to an RG, R, R, RG8X, but it's it's extremely flexible. I forget what number it is, but the stuff is super duper flexible. It's low loss, it's really nice stuff. But in the field, honestly, I usually carry cheap RG316. I used to have some nice expensive RG316. It got damaged out in the field. This stuff is cheap, and if it gets damaged, I don't really care. Throw it in the garbage, buy a new piece. If I damage a 50 or $60 section of coax, it's gonna bother me. If I, dollar, if I damage an $11 section of coax, I don't really care. Okay, so is it better to carry better quality coax in the field? Probably, it's definitely gonna be better coax. But like I said, you've gotta consider the fact that especially if you're dragging this thing out in the woods, it may get damaged. So that's something you might wanna consider also. All right, so like I said, size, you know, big and bulky. Obviously, if you're running, you know, depending on what frequencies you're running, uh, how much power you're running, all those kinds of things, you may have to change different sizes and you're gonna have to play around with the stuff. Length, like I said, that's kinda kinda depend on what you're doing. If I'm putting up a, a dipole, for instance, I need longer coax because I wanna get that antenna way up in the air. You probably, you can't see it, but my, my end fed is up there about 30, 35 feet, right? If you don't have enough coax to get it up there, you're gonna have a hard time doing it, right? So that's something to consider as well. Connectors. Uh, Everything I own, except for my shack radio is BNC. Um, you know, PL259, SO239, that kind of stuff. That's what's on my shack radio. Everything I use for field use is BNC. The only, the only field radio I have that isn't BNC is my G90, and I have adapters to run BNC. This is not one for that radio, but um, I have adapters to run from one to the other. That's something you want to consider too, is do you need a bunch of adapters? I usually bring adapters with me just to be on the safe side. Uh, this one, as you can see, is female to male BNC, all right? And then loss, that's something you got to consider too. Remember, the higher the frequency you're running, the worse the loss is going to be. So when you're running, you know, 80 meters, 40 meters, it's not a big deal. If you're going to be running, you know, 12 meters, 10 meters, 6 meters, or, you know, if you're going to be running like 2 meters, or God, 70 centimeters, that's really something you've got to consider, right? The loss in that, that coax can become pretty crazy. So that's something you really need to take a look at too. If you're gonna be running higher frequencies, you really need to pay attention to the loss on that coax. Um, and again, this is gonna to be totally dependent on your situation. For me, I can get away, I usually run, the highest band I usually run is 20 meters. I can get away with the crap that I normally run. If I was running higher, higher frequencies, I would probably run better coax. 
Now, where are you gonna be setting up? Open area versus woods, right? So, you know, this vertical works great here in my backyard. I've got plenty of room to spread those radials out. I've got plenty of room for that, that, that mast, or the, uh, yeah, the antenna mast to clear, right? My big 17 foot tall antenna whip. In the woods, this thing's a nightmare, right? I, you gotta get that up through the trees. You gotta get all these things spread out through the brush and stuff. This is probably not the greatest antenna to use out in the woods. You can do it, but it's gonna be kind of a pain in the butt. I use these verticals where I can't set up uh, wire antennas. I'll, I'll use these things. Like if I'm at a state park and they don't want us putting stuff in the trees, and it depends on the state park. Some will let me, some won't. But if I can't put stuff in the trees, I gotta run a vertical or a loop. I don't have a loop, but you could do that too. But again, this thing takes up a tremendous amount of room on the ground and I've gotta be able to clear trees and stuff with that big whip, right? So that's something to consider as well. If you're setting up in an open area, obviously something like this works well. Now, an NFED or a dipole, that's gonna be awfully hard in, in the open. If you don't have any place to get that antenna up in the air, if there's no trees to put the antenna in, you're gonna need a mast. You're gonna need something to guide those out to, right? So in the open, a wire antenna could be kind of a pain in the butt. In the woods, a vertical can be, can, be, can be kind of difficult to work with. So again, where you're setting up is going to kind of dictate what kind of antenna you're running. Uh, you know, if I'm if I'm in really dense foliage, I, I probably the, the wire antennas cannot kind of even be difficult because they're hard to get up through the trees and stuff. Honestly, this little gable with the little short eight and a half foot radials I've got for this thing works good in really dense brush because it's not very tall and the radials aren't very long. But if I've got big trees, I'm gonna be putting a wire antenna up all day, every day if I can, okay? Um, are there trees to set up in? Like I said, if there aren't trees, you're probably gonna need a mast. Will there be foot traffic near you? This is something you need to consider, right? Because like if you look at this vertical, I've got, like I said, 12, 16 foot radials coming off of this thing and if you're in a state park and there's a bunch of kids running around the chances of them hooking their foot on one of these radials and yanking down your antenna is pretty high if you're in the middle of nowhere where the only thing you're like uh, likely to see is a deer it's probably not a big deal okay so that's really something you need to consider if you're setting up a, a wire antenna up in the trees and you've got, let's say you're putting a dipole up and you've got to guy that thing way out, right? Pay attention to where those guy lines are going down. Make sure they're not going to be where foot traffic is going to be, where people are going to be running through. Um, I did an activation back earlier in the spring at Sugar Hill State Forest. And right at the end of the activation, in fact, if you watch the video, you can see at the very end of the activation, out of the woods, out of nowhere, comes a guy and his dog. And they walked, I was running, uh, in fact, I was running this and fed random wire right here. And they walked right, oh, right into the antenna and I had to kind of be like whoa watch yourself dude now I was not expecting to see people there there's never anybody where I was until there was right so that's something to consider also that's why I kind of went to all this high vis orange wire because it's hard to miss so pay attention to foot traffic you know pay attention to where things like trails are we'll talk about a lot of that stuff when we talk about places to uh, set up to activate but if there's gonna be a lot of foot traffic you probably don't want this giant radial field if you're gonna run this kind of antenna where there's gonna be a lot of foot traffic you're probably gonna want to use a um a window screen ground system ground radial system for it right as opposed to this huge radial field i've got are there activation site restrictions and requirements can you use the trees do you need a mast, right? So like, there are some of the state parks I, I activate at, you can't put stuff in the trees. Now, like I said, some of them, they don't care. Some of them, they do. Some of it depends on where you are in the park. The state forest, they don't care. But if I'm at a state park and they don't want me putting things in the trees, right, I'm probably bringing one of these verticals. If you need to run a wire antenna and you can't put stuff in the trees, you're gonna need a mast. Now, I don't have my mast out here with me. Um, I have a mast attached to the back of my shed. You can see it sticking up right there. It's not extended at the moment, but uh, you might need to bring a mast with you, okay? Can you put stakes in the ground? There are places where you can't put stakes in the ground. So if you're gonna run uh, an antenna that needs to be guide out, be careful with that. If you're gonna put a mast up and it's gonna require you to guy that mask to the ground, that mask to the ground, and you can't put stakes in the ground. That's a consideration also, right? In that case, I mean, something like this is probably a good choice because it's a tripod. It's not hurting anything. Nothing is going into the ground. So that's something you need to consider. Always check, and we'll talk about this when we talk about um, activation, talking about the actual activation sites in a later video, some of those considerations. Now, power requirements. This one's pretty simple. Will the antenna that you're gonna run handle the power you're gonna run? 
right? So some of these antennas are QRP antennas, right? I'm not gonna run, you know, 100 watts through some of these little tiny antennas. They're, they're not designed for it, right? Now my, my shack antenna, like I said, you can't really see, I don't know if you can see the wire or not, it's up there. That, it's a Palomar engineering uh, bullet 77 or uh, 71. That'll take, I forget what, 500 watts, something like that. I only run 100 watts through it. Um, but pay attention to that, right? If you're running QR, QRO power, you're, you're gonna need an antenna that can handle that. QRP doesn't really matter. Pretty much anything will take the QR, you know, 510 watts. But if you're gonna run a 100 watt rig or higher, make sure that the antenna you're running can handle that power. Remember, some of that power handling requirement is gonna de depend on the mode and the duty cycle, right? So if you're doing single sideband, your antenna is probably gonna be able to take more power than if you're doing CW or digital, right? If you're running FT8, your duty cycle is really high on FT8, right? That's gonna be transmitting for 15 seconds at a pop. You need to make sure that antenna can handle that amount of power for that long, okay? Weight and size. This is sort of one of the things that I really consider. Much like the radio, are you setting up 10 feet from a vehicle or are you hiking five miles into the woods or climbing a mountain, right? Are you setting up on a vehicle? Those will all help determine what antenna you choose. If I'm hiking way back into the woods or I'm climbing a mountain, there's a 0% chance I'm bringing that big vertical. None at all. It's too big, too heavy, right? If I'm climbing a mountain, I'm probably bringing that NFED, all right? Um, that little uh, spark plug NFED and the, that little wire right there. I'm probably, or maybe that link dipole, all right? If I have to bring a vertical, it's gonna be the gable because it's way smaller. So again, that's something to consider. You don't wanna hike up a mountain with a huge, heavy antenna. Conversely, if you're setting up 10 feet from your car, nobody cares. You can bring the biggest antenna you want. But that's, that's gonna, a lot of that's gonna depend on, again, where you're activating. If you're setting up at your vehicle, right, you, you might, for instance, if you've got like, a, let's say, a Yezu uh, 891, you can run an ATOS hooked right to your vehicle. You don't have to worry about anything. You tune that sucker up and let her rip. So that's something to consider as well. And like I said, we talked about resonant versus, versus non-resonant earlier. Resonant antennas are generally the most efficient and they're not gonna require a tuner. Most of my field radios don't have tuners. The only field radios I have that have tuners are the G90, the KX2, and the KX1. And the, the tuner in the KX1 is not that great. The KX2 and the G90 have phenomenal tuners in them. If you're running a resonant, tu or re resonant antenna, I don't need a tuner. We don't have to worry about it. But if you're gonna run a, if you're gonna run a non resonant antenna, you have to have an antenna tuner. So if I'm gonna run my NFED random wire, I have to have an antenna tuner, okay? So in that case, do I want a radio with an internal tuner? Or do we want an external tuner, something like this little ZM2, right? Or uh, like a, Elecraft makes a little tiny portable tuner, so does ICOM. Uh, just keep in mind, those use batteries, right? This one doesn't. This is a Z-Match tuner. There's no batteries in this thing. Um, if you're using something that runs batteries, make sure those batteries are charged, right? This thing, it doesn't matter. This is a little more finicky to tune. Now, once you get used to using this, you can tune real fast on it. But until you get the hang of this, it can be a little fiddly. The, the Elecraft one, you push some buttons and bang, it tunes you up, right? So that's something to consider also. Now, in the field, especially if you're running QRP, it's probably a good idea to run resonant antennas. Not to say you always have to. I just did an activation today with the KX1 running like one watt through an NFED random wire. And it was ugly, but I got it done. All right, there was some issues with it. You'll see um, you'll see the video. It'll come out uh, in a few weeks. But, um, you know, that's something to consider. If you're running low power and you're running a non-resonant antenna through a tuner and everything, you're losing some of that power that you could be using to radiate out. You know, you're wasting it because you're using it, you're using a non-resonant antenna and a tuner. Um, if, do you need to be able to switch bands on the fly? If you do, and you're gonna run a resonant antenna, make sure you're running something like that, that NFED half wave, where th th I can just on the fly go from 40 to 20 to 15. Now on my NFED random wire, if I've got a tuner, and that NFED random wire and the tuner will match it, I can run uh, anything from 40 down on that wire. Right, I don't need to worry about just push a button, boom, go. So that's super agile, right? So on my KX2 or my G90, especially my G90 because it's more power, I can hook that sucker up, tune it up, and I can switch bands in a hurry. Now, generally when you're activating, you don't need to worry about switching bands in a hurry, but sometimes it's nice then I have to get out and fiddle with things. If I'm running that link dipole, I need to lower that down, disconnect the links, and put it back up in the air again. That takes a little bit of time. 
So that's something to consider as well. And then SWR meters. If you're bringing an antenna that needs to be tuned, like that Wolf River coils or that gable, you're gonna need a tuner, an antenna SWR meter of some sort, okay? Um, I've got a Nano VNA here. You could run a Rig Expert. They're a lot more expensive, but, or if you, you know, you've ever, I'm sure everybody's seen one of these before. These are not exactly a secret, right? These are like, I don't know, 50 bucks on Amazon, but this thing works great for measuring SWR. So like when I'm tuning that gable, I hook that thing up, I tune the coil, I disconnect that, I hook my radio up and I'm ready to rip. Now, a lot of my radios have SWR meters in them as well. So I could use the SWR meter in the radio. I would rather tune it up with this thing first and then just hook it up to the radio and go. Um, especially if it's a high Q antenna, you're gonna be bouncing back and forth between the rig and the antenna trying to get it tuned up. It's awfully fiddly. Some people have the patience for that. I don't. And keep in mind, it's probably not great for your radio if you're running tons of SWR trying to get that thing tuned up. So you may need an SWR meter, okay? So like I said, sometimes the radio will do it for you. Depends on how much patience you have and how far out the SWR is. Another thing to consider, homebrew versus commercial. So like I said, a lot of these antennas I build myself. So like that, that dipole right there, I built myself. Uh, that NFAT I built myself. I didn't, I didn't build the, the actual transformer, although they're not that hard to build. I built that link dipole myself. I built that NFAN random wire myself. They're really easy to build. Building an antenna, a wire antenna particularly, is not very difficult. Now, building something like that, a little trickier. I mean, I could make the coil myself, but building that whip by myself, I could probably do it. I'm pretty handy, but it would take me a while. It'd be a pain in the butt. So for something like this, I'm probably buying commercial. For these wire antennas, I'm probably not going to waste my money. I mean, you know, like when I bought that spark plug. So this thing's I forgot these are like 45 bucks. All right. I think this thing's like 45 bucks. I could build this myself. It's not there. They're, they're NFED's not that hard to build. I like this because it was real compact. It's real robust. This thing's pretty rugged. But here's the thing. If you buy this as a complete kit with the wire and the winder and everything, it's a hundred bucks. That piece of wire is a couple of dollars. And it's got one spade terminal on it that I, that I crimped and soldered. Some heat shrink. It's a few bucks, right? I've talked about not needing winders before. I don't need winders. I know how to do a figure eight. So I just wind that thing up in a figure eight. Winders are a waste. So I could buy just this for 45 bucks or I could buy a piece of wire and a winder for another $55. I don't think so. All right. So like I said, try building your own antenna. Like build, dipoles are so easy to build. It's not even funny. Like I said, end feds are not that hard even, either. Even if you're building the, the, the transformer and everything yourself from scratch, they're not that hard to build. So do you have to buy one? Absolutely not. Do you want to? I mean, if you want to buy a nice commercial antenna, be my guest. It's entirely up to you. Um, but there's something to be said about building your own antenna. It actually gives you a lot of understanding as to how that thing actually functions. You know, building it and getting the SWR dialed in and looking at the inductance and all those things, it, 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 it gives you a better understanding of how the antenna works. So I, I, like I said, all my wire antennas I build myself with the exception of that, that spark plug, uh, transformer because again that thing's so small and it's so robust i was like that's ah, 45 bucks i'll buy one all right like i said commercial antennas are usually simple though they're plug and play you don't need to mess with them you don't need to tune them you don't need to do anything some familiar some fi so sorry excuse me some familiar ugh, i can't talk today some familiarity may be required with tuning but they're otherwise easy to set up and operate homebrew antennas can be built to suit exactly what you need exactly how you want it okay it's more work but it's also quite rewarding if you roll your own, you're gonna need some basic tools, some basic skills, some basic knowledge. I mean, I take into the field with me a pair of crimpers, some wire cutters. This thing's got terminals and stuff in it, some electrical tape. If I need to repair antennas, I can do that, okay? Um, but you're gonna need some basic uh, soldering iron, some crimpers, nothing crazy. Um, you're gonna need some way to measure SWR. But aside from that, they're really not that hard to build. So like I said, do you want to buy commercial? Do you want to build your own? Do you want a combination of the two? I use a combination of the two. My verticals are all commercial. My wire antennas are all home built, except for that one NFED that I use, that spark plug. All my other NFEDs are home built. Well, that's not true. The NFED random wire in my house is Palomar, but like I said, all of my, my field ones are, are home brews. The last thing I want to talk about are HT antennas, because we talked before about radios and we said that you know some of this can be done on two meter or 70 centimeter or one and a quarter meter, whatever. If you're gonna do that, keep in mind, you're gonna need an antenna for your HT. Now the stock rubber duck is probably not gonna cut it. So, I mean, everybody's familiar with the signal stick. I got two signal sticks here. I've got a glow in the dark one and a black one. 
I love these things. They're awesome. They're super flexible. They're hard to beat up. They're quarter wave on two meters. They work pretty well. Um, this probably would not be my choice if I was trying to get out though. They work for the vast majority of things, but if you're really trying to get your signal out and you want one that's attached to the radio, I have two half wave two meter antennas here. So this is a smiley two meter half wave BNC. I like BNC connectors on everything. And this is an MFJ Long Ranger half wave two meter BNC. Um, I found that the MFJ works a little bit better, but the Smiley is flexible. So I'm a little more comfortable with this one on the radio if I'm moving around because it's got some give, right? I'm not as worried about that break in that antenna jack on my radio is this one this one's real rigid so when this is on there it's it's kind of sketchy especially when this thing's extended right it's long it's like three feet long and you got all that leverage out there on top of the radio um but if i'm like i said if i'm if i'm being honest i think the mfj works a tiny bit better like i said the smiley i think is a little more um forgiving on the radio you could run so like here's a roll up j-pole and there's all sorts of these out there. You can build these yourself or you can buy a commercial one. This is a commercial one. They're not hard to build though. Like I said, homebrewing wire antennas is not that tough. Some ladder lines, some coax, some connectors, not a big deal. Uh, this will get the, the signal out even better because you can get this way up in a tree, right? I can get this, you know, 15, 20 feet in the air and get a signal out with this. Maybe if you're, you know, you're out west and you're on top of a mountain, you might want to invest in a Yagi right then you can point that antenna right at a population center and start calling i don't have a yagi they're not real useful around here for much because i don't have much open space and there are no population centers near any of the big peaks so it really isn't useful but out west yeah absolutely a yagi might be useful so uh let's just kind of reiterate some of these points and i just want to make sure that everybody is, is clear on what i'm trying to do here i'm not trying to tell you what kind of antenna to buy or what kind of antenna to build i just want to give you some things to think about before you build or buy an antenna right so do you want a wire antenna a vertical antenna a loop if it's a wire antenna do you want an end fed or a dipole they both have advantages and disadvantages is it going to be vehicle mounted right how high is the queue how efficient is it how hard is it to set up do you need a choke or a ballon then you got to consider your coax how, how big a piece of coax do you need both in, in thickness and in length do you need cheap coax? Do you need expensive coax? Do you need, what kind of connectors do you need? Do you need BNC? Do you need, you know, SO239 or PL259, whatever? How lossy is it, right? Depending on what you're doing, you might have to be worried about loss. Where are you gonna be setting it up? Are you gonna set up in the woods or in the open? Are there trees to set up in? Is there foot traffic in your area that you have to worry about radials? Are there activation site restrictions, right? Can you use the trees or do you need a mast? Can you put stakes in the ground? Your power requirements. Will the antenna handle the amount of power you're intending to run? Pay attention to your mode and your duty cycle. Your weight and size, right? If we're gonna be climbing a mountain or going five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 miles into the woods, I do not wanna carry a seven pound antenna into the woods. I'll carry a seven ounce antenna into the woods though. Resonant versus non-resonant. Resonant antennas are gonna be way more efficient. They're not quite as agile, right? Switching bands isn't quite as simple. However, if you're gonna run a non-resonant antenna, you're gonna need a tuner either an internal tuner in your radio or an external tuner. Do you need an SWR meter? If you're gonna be running some, well, something like one of these verticals, you might. Like I said, you might be able to get away with the SWR meter in your radio, you might not. And then lastly, as far as HF antennas are concerned, commercial versus homebrew. Do you wanna buy an antenna and have it ready to go? There are lots of good commercial antennas out there. Or do you wanna build your own? Building your own is cheap. You learn something about how antennas work and you can tailor the antenna to exactly what you want. Like I said, when I build these things, I build them tiny, I build them light, because I don't want to carry a bunch of crap I don't need to carry into the woods. And then finally, HT antennas. Do you want a, an antenna that's attached to the radio, like one of those two meter half waves? Or do you want something like a roll-up J-pole or a Yagi, where we've got a piece of coax and we can get that thing up in the air or we can point it directly at a population center? So those are just some considerations when you look at antennas, and again, there are different antennas for different purposes. I don't own one antenna, as you, and this is not, these aren't all the antennas I own, but as you can see, I have a lot of different antennas. I have a lot of different types of antennas. They have a lot of different uses, right? My verticals get different, are used for different things than my wire antennas. I set them up in different places. Um, one thing I didn't mention is things like takeoff angle. Generally, verticals are gonna have a little bit shallower takeoff angle, so they're, they get out pretty good. Um, your wire antennas, especially if they're lower, especially if you're on a lower band, like 40 or 80 meters, will work really good for NVIS. Uh, 
you know, and they generally don't work quite as good for DX, although I work DX all the time on this and fed random wire that's 25, 30 feet in the air. So it's not really an issue. I wouldn't worry too much about that stuff. But at the end of the day, just like the radio, pick an antenna that's gonna work for your intended use, right? Where are we gonna operate? How much power are we gonna run? What modes are we gonna run? Do I have trees? Are there any considerations as far as foot traffic? Can I set stuff up in the trees here? Those kinds of things. Once you answer those questions, then you can choose an antenna that's gonna suit those needs. And you're probably gonna need more than one antenna. When you start out, pick a type. You know, if you're gonna be setting up an open space, a vertical's nice to have. If you're gonna be setting up in trees, a wire antenna's probably nice to have. But once you get rolling in this, you're probably gonna end up with a whole bunch of different antennas, a bunch of different pieces of coax, a bunch of different other things to kind of get the job done. So, hopefully that gives you some things to think about. First, we gotta look at what radio we're gonna run, what motor we're gonna run, then we can choose an antenna. Then we need to figure out what kind of antenna we wanna run based on the conditions where we're gonna activate it. Uh, in later episodes, we'll be talking about things like how to pick, where to activate, how to set up the activation zone, all those kinds of things, okay? So we'll talk about those considerations and we'll cover some of the antenna specifics when we talk about those things. So with that being said, I really appreciate you watching. I hope you learned something. If you have any ideas or any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. If you disagree with me about everything, anything, that's fine. Tell me in the comments, tell me why you think I'm wrong. We can debate it. I'm not, you're not gonna hurt my feelings. Um, if I missed something, please let me know in the comments. Like I said, I do not have every kind of antenna known to man. I don't have experience with loops. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't use big, heavy antennas. Everything I use generally is field expedient, kind of like my radios. I did have some criticisms of my, my radio video, people, a lot of people, and, and they were right. They just said, you didn't talk a lot about QRO radios. I didn't because I don't have any. I don't have any experience with field QRO radios. The highest I ever run in the field is 20 watts. Same thing with my antennas. I don't have big high power antennas because I don't run big high power radios in the field. All right, so uh, I'm gonna cut you guys loose. Hopefully that was helpful. Uh, like I said, if you got questions, leave them down below. I will link to that document in the description. Uh, I'll probably link to a couple videos in cards so you can kind of see some of these antennas in action. With that being said, I will see you on the next one. Thanks for watching. 7-3.